I've shared with you before an occasion where it was in the 1980s, I wore a pin that said, God is love, and it had a little heart underneath. I think it even had a cross on it. I, I love wearing that pin. I wore that pin proudly. But it just so happens that on one occasion when I wore it, I found myself in a situation where I was, <laughs> I was upset, to say the least. No, 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 I, I was angry, to say the least. No, 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 I was something else, to say the least. And I wanted to handle that situation in a manner that was not consistent with the, <laughs> with the spirit of Christ. And as I went to handle the situation, I remembered that I had the pin on that said, God is love. And there was no way I could do what I was about to do and say what I was about to say wearing the pin that said, God is love. Now, God has a way of dealing with fools and knuckleheads, and he, he stopped me in my tracks because I wasn't going to not do what I was going to do. I was simply going to take the pin off. <laughs> But God stopped me before, before I sinned, which is what I was about to do. God is love. And I, I wore that proudly. But even though he is love, he's, he's a God of love, we sometimes are reluctant to associate God's name with the word hate. But just as much as God is a God of love, God is also a God of hate. Let's make no mistake about that. God doesn't hate anyone, but there are certain things that God hates. There are certain things even more than that that God considers an abomination. And there's a gap between hate and abomination. If someone went in a store, we saw a news story, someone went in the store and stole a pack of gum. We would hate that because it's sin. But if the news story was about child abuse, well, that's more of an abomination. And in God's mind, it's the very same way. All sin is bad, but there are some sins that in God's sight are an abomination. The Bible mentions several sins that are an abomination. In the Old Testament, the word idolatry is often used. It's not used so much in the New Testament, although the sin of idolatry continues throughout the New Testament. And idolatry is giving glory to anyone or anything instead of giving that glory to God. Robbing God of his glory and giving it to anyone or anything. God finds it an abomination because it turns the hearts of his people away from him. In the Old Testament, there was the practice of offering up animal sacrifices to God. And God said, when you bring your animal sacrifice, make sure it is your absolute best sacrifice. Don't go to your flock and grab that animal that was fixing to die anyway and say, here you go, God, this is for you. And as ridiculous as that is, God's children do the very same thing today. It may not be an animal sacrifice, but we have a tendency of giving God our leftovers instead of giving God our absolute best. God considers that an abomination. Deuteronomy chapter 17. God also considers engaging in occult practices an abomination. I'm talking about voodoo witchcraft, Ouija boards, horoscope, any of that foolishness, God considers that an abomination. The God, he finds it offensive because we should put our trust in his ability to save, in his ability to deliver, in his ability to heal. And when our trust is put in any of these other things, God finds it extremely offensive and calls it an abomination. Yeah. Dishonest business practices, God considers that an abomination. No doubt you've taken your car to a mechanic and you've sweated wondering, is this fool going to rip me off for my money, charge me for a repair that's not necessary, or overcharge me for a necessary repair? God considers dishonest business 
practices an abomination. You call someone over your house for a home repair, to repair a furnace, to repair something that's broken in your house, and you wonder whether or not you will be cheated because it's such a common practice. God considers this an abomination. You've walked onto an auto sales lot to buy a car, and you've wondered, am I going to get cheated in the price as I negotiate this car? God considers that kind of dishonest business practice an abomination. In any occupation you can think of, even our teachers in school, if they do not give our children the best education they can, which I did not get in inner city schools, God considers that an abomination. Deuteronomy chapter 25, the Bible says this, do not have two differing weights in your bag, one heavy, one light. Do not have two differing measures in your house. If you went to buy a pound of beef for your Thanksgiving dinner, the butcher would have a scale so that when you put five pounds of beef on the scale, he'd already have it boosted three pounds. So you would pay eight pounds for eight pounds of beef and only get five pounds of beef. That's what he's talking about here in Deuteronomy chapter 25. God said, don't use dishonest scales. So something we see as small and simple, God considers an abomination. And then there's this one. Homosexuality. Homosexuality. God considers an abomination. Now, you don't have to wait to ask your preacher about this one. You don't have to wait to ask anybody. In fact, I want you to read this one with me. Leviticus chapter 18 and verse 22. Leviticus chapter 18, verse 22, mark, it, mark that one there, keep your finger there, and also turn to Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 13. Leviticus 18, verse 22, and then Leviticus 20 and verse 13. Now keep in mind, this sin is no worse than any other. But it's becoming commonly accepted as right. Let's see what the Bible says about it. Leviticus chapter 18, verse 22. Do not have sexual relations with a man as one does with a woman. That is detestable. Now read with me. I want you to read with me Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 13. Everybody there, read this one with me. If a man... If read it with me, if a man has sexual relations with a man as one does with a woman, both of them, both of them have done what is detestable. They are to be put to death. That was under the Old Testament law. Their blood will be on their own heads. Now, the scripture is not unclear when it comes to that issue. The scripture is very, very clear. There's no dispute. And it's to be addressed just as any other sin. Well, someone says, we are not under the Old Testament. I'm sure you've heard that before. We're no longer under the Old Testament. You may have heard people say that, but that didn't come from the Bible. It did not come from the Bible. We are still under the Old Testament. And here's how you know. In times of comfort, where do you go? Times that you need comfort. Psalms chapter 23. I think you all know it like I do. The Lord is my shepherd. That's found in the Old Testament. And if we go to the Old Testament for one verse, then it's okay for all verses. If we're going to say we're no longer under, under the Old Testament, then we shouldn't go to it at all. Michael stood up here this morning. And quoted from Isaiah chapter 53. How else would we know that he was bruised for our transgressions? He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And it's by his stripes that we are healed. How else would we know that but for Isaiah chapter 53, which is in the Old Testament? Oh yes, brothers and sisters, the Old Testament is very relevant today. Jeremiah chapter 29, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper 
you spiritually plans to prosper you that comes from the Old Testament Jeremiah chapter 29 God's love is on display throughout the Old Testament God's mercy is on display throughout the Old Testament God's grace is on display throughout the Old Testament to know the true character of God you've got to read the Old Testament Romans chapter 15 and verse 4, the Apostle Paul said, the things that were written aforetime, in times past, in the Old Testament times, those were written for our learning, so that through patience and learning the scriptures, we might have hope. He's talking about the Old Testament. So it's just as applicable as it is today. Now, there are parts of the Old Testament that are not applicable to us, just as there are parts of the New Testament that are not applicable to us. When the Apostle Paul says through Timothy, I instruct you, you know where he says women be silent in the church, we're aware of that. But right after that he says, I don't want women to wear gold, jewels, braided hair, fancy hairstyles, none of that. And we'll apply women be silent in the church, but we won't apply the rest of that verse. The fact of the matter is all of it was culturally applicable in that day, but not culturally applicable today. So there are parts of the Old and New Testament that are applicable to our lives and parts that are not. Now, these things that are an abomination to God, those who are guilty of these things can count on getting a visit from God. And you can bet your last money when God comes to visit, under those circumstances, he ain't coming alone. He's bringing wrath with him. And when God comes in wrath, nothing but dead bodies are left behind him. Psalms chapter 50, verse 22. Consider this, you that forget God, lest I tear you in pieces when no one can deliver you. Let's talk about the wrath of God. This same loving God that we talked about is a God of hate, is a God of wrath. He hates that which is an abomination. Psalm chapter 29 and verse 1, a disobedient, hard-headed person who refuses to respond to God's will will ultimately face God's discipline. And that ain't a good thing. Remember, this is the same God who when his own children were disobedient. God said to his sword, wake up and go to work. And God sent his sword out clean, but it came back dripping with the blood of his very own disobedient and hard-headed children. Now, this is not a complete list of all the things God hates. Turn over to Proverbs chapter 6. The writer of Proverbs just lists some things that God hates. Proverbs chapter 6, beginning at verse 16. We know God hates all sins, but he took care to specify these sins in Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 16. Beginning in verse 16. There are six things the Lord hates, yea, seven are an abomination. To the Lord. All seven of these are an abomination to the Lord. All sin is bad. God hates all sin, but these seven are an abomination to the Lord. He says in verse 17, haughty eyes, prideful eyes, a lying tongue. Yes, even those little white ones, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes. Feet that are quick to rush into evil. A false witness who pours out lies and a person who stirs up conflict in the community. Now we view some of these as small sins. You know how we like to categorize sins, big sin, little sin. We view some of these as small sins. God views these as an abomination. Let's talk about these. A proud look, a haughty spirit, haughty eyes. God hates pride. 
Pride is at the root of just about every sin we commit. Because when we sin, we're saying, God, I'm going to do what I want to do in spite of what you want me to do. I know what you want me to do. God. You know that those moments when we're alone and we know what we should do, but we know what we want to do. We know what God wants us to do, but we want to do what who wants to do? What I want to do. That's why God finds it so offensive. It's pride. It's putting our will above God's will. It's an attitude that overvalues ourselves above everyone else, including God. I'm more important than you, God. I'm certainly more important than all of y'all, but I'm more important than God as well. So I'm going to do what Rollin wants to do. Never mind what God wants me. Now, I ain't going to say that out loud. I ain't a fool. Plus, I'm scared of lightning. <laughs> but we do it, and God knows the heart. We don't have to say it. Yes. Remember, before we commit the sin, God knows it. <clears throat> God hates pride. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18. Pride, go, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. If you know that pride was prancing down prideful parkway, why would you follow pride? If you knew that pride was strutting down the street, why would you follow pride? God finds pride an abomination. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful. You might be standing on ice. We had a friend. I'm going to call her Carolyn's friend, and you'll understand why in a minute. Because as I served communion there, there was a stairway. And she just, she just waited every Sunday. I don't know how much she paid attention to the service. Because she told me, she said, Robert, if you ever fall down them stairs, I'm going to laugh so hard. <laughs> And so every Sunday I was nervous because of her, Carolyn's friend, nervous serving the communion because she was just waiting for me to, to fall and, and just wipe out. Well, pride is that way as we walk through life being members of the Lord's church and being so confident because we're members of the right church that we're going to heaven. You know, everybody else is going to hell. The Bible says be careful. Be careful how you stand so that you don't Fall. Romans chapter 12, beginning at verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercies, that you offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, which is your spiritual worship. Now he says in verse 3, for by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought to. It's easy to get caught up in the sin of pride. He said you will bring judgment on yourself. Luke chapter 18. To some who were confident in their own righteousness. To some who thought, well, me and God, we got it, so I ain't got to worry about it. I'm going to live how I want to live because me and God got it. To those, Jesus said, let me tell you a story about two men who went up to the temple to pray. One of them, a Pharisee. Now in that day, a Pharisee was the equivalent of our elders today. These dudes knew the Bible from the time they were little kids. The Bible says a Pharisee and a tax collector. Now a tax collector in that day, to use that word, use the word sinner to replace tax collector. It was the same thing. That's how despicable a tax collector was considered. Everybody knew he was a crook. A Pharisee and a tax collector went up to the temple to pray. The Bible says the Pharisee, he looked up to God and said, God, I know you're glad to have me on your team. He said, I thank you, God, that I ain't like all these other folks. I don't sin like them, God. You, you, you know that, God. He started to tell God what he does. I fast. I read my Bible. I give more money in the church than anybody else. I take a big sip on the communion cup. He was telling God how good he was, like God didn't know that. And the Bible says the tax collector, the scoundrel, he wouldn't even look up to God. He humbled himself, he kept his head down, and he said, God, be merciful to me, 
because I'm a sinner. And Jesus said, which one of those two do you think was justified in the eyes of God? The one who was the religious dude and had all the religious training and did all the things. When you looked at him, you say, that's a righteous dude right there. Jesus said, uh-uh. This scoundrel, because of his humble prayer, was the one that was justified before God. That's how much God hates pride. He calls it an abomination. Acts chapter 12, King Herod. Bible says he had on his royal robes. He was dressed to kill, dressed to the nines. He stood up and he gave a great speech and the people said, wow, man, you the man. We ain't never heard nobody speak like you. You are all that. And Herod's head got big. The Bible said that he refused to give glory to God. He was so filled with pride that he would not give God the glory he deserved. And God killed him on the spot. Now on the other hand, the apostle Paul over in Acts chapter 14, Paul and Barnabas, they were preaching. And the people said the same thing. They said, oh man, we ain't never heard anybody bring it like you. You two must be gods. The apostle Paul, he was afraid when they said that. He knew what happened to Herod. He said, uh-uh. <laughs> he said, don't be giving me that kind of praise. He said, I'm a man just like you. Give the glory to God. God hates pride. He considers it an abomination. Also, a lying tongue. God considers that an abomination. God hates lying. But there's something about lying that man loves. See, lying is convenient. Lying can be comfortable. Lying can be crafty. But lying is by all means catastrophic. That's a new word I learned last week. I couldn't wait to use it. <laughs> Lying can be convenient. See, if lying is right there on the shelf. We can take it off the shelf. I thought brother, brothers coming up here and telling me, you lying, man. <laughs> lying is right there on the shelf just waiting for us. Take it off, use as much as we want. Put it back so we can go back and use it later. That's how convenient lying is. Especially when our backs against the wall. Lying is our best friend. How am I going to get out of this situation? I'm going to straight up lie. It's, it's, I can't even say it with a straight face. It's convenient. It's comfortable. It feels comfortable because it makes us feel good. Whew, got out of that situation. I'm glad God is merciful. I'm glad God is merciful. It's convenient. It's comfortable. It's crafty. Because it's tricky. It's sly. It's the hustler's game. And unfortunately, God's children too often try to hustle God. Lying is convenient. It's comfortable. It's crafty. But it's also catastrophic. <laughs> Because it leads to disappointment. It leads to danger. It leads to destruction. And it leads to death. Spiritual death for sure. But sometimes physical death as well. You and I have seen in the news recently. And it hurts me to see how many black politicians have gone to prison. Dallas and Fort Worth. For lying. I know of one who I've known for years. If I mentioned his name, you would know it. And I remember a lie he told 20 some odd years ago. And I told Carolyn, I said, every time we saw him on the news, I said, that brother ain't right. <laughs> that brother ain't right. It's going to catch up with him. 
She got tired of me talking about it. One year went by, I saw him get his political job, and I was mad because I knew he was a lying scoundrel. Five years went by, he stayed in his career. Ten years went by, he stayed in his career. I'm not going to tell you how many years because then you'll know who I'm talking about. But finally, his lie caught up with him. And he disgracefully was dismissed from his position. He's one of many. Lying can be catastrophic. God finds a lying tongue an abomination. The tongue was created in order to give God glory. But when we use it as an instrument for lying, it robs God of the glory he deserves. James chapter 3. This is a long reading. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault is what they say is perfect, able to keep their body in check. Watch what he says about this now. Verse 3. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn that whole animal. Horse, that's a strong dude right there. And yet, putting a bit in his mouth, we can control that whole animal. Or take ships, for example. Although they are so large, driven by strong winds, they are steered by a small rudder. Just a, a small thing at the, at the back of the ship steers that whole ship. Likewise, verse 5, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by just a small spark. He said the tongue corrupts the whole body. It sets the whole course of one's life on fire. And itself is set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, sea creatures being tamed have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. Boy, that's dangerous. You've seen somebody's tongue get them in trouble. And probably your own tongue has gotten you in trouble at times. With the tongue, watch this, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we cuss out human beings. Same tongue. Saturday night, cussing somebody out. Sunday morning, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. <laughs> My brothers and sisters, James said, this should not be so. One of the biggest lies often told on Sunday mornings is this. Oh, how I love Jesus. That's one of the biggest lies told on Sunday mornings. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 20. Whoever claims to love God and yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. Is a liar. That ain't me talking. That's a Bible talk. Whoever claims to love God and yet hates a brother or sister. That means any conflicts in the church. Any conflict. We don't like them. He don't like him. She don't like her. Whatever the case may be. Wherever that exists, that person or those people cannot say, I love God. Otherwise, they're lying. Remember what Jesus said? If you come to offer your sacrifice at the altar and you remember there's an issue between you and a brother or sister, leave your sacrifice there. Your praise ain't going to go up before God. It ain't, I don't care how much you sing. It ain't going up. How much you pray, it ain't going up. How much communion cracker you eat, it ain't going up. You got to go and make it right with that brother or sister. You can't hate one of God's children and love God. God finds that an abomination. Then he said, God finds an abomination, hands that shed innocent blood. He's talking about murder. And we all know that you can kill someone physically, but you can also do it psychologically, emotionally, mentally. First John chapter three, 
Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a what? Murderer. Wow. Wow. That's strong. I mean, I don't hate them. I just don't want nothing to do with them. That's murder. God puts it on the same level. He also finds an abomination, a heart that devises wicked imagination. Everyone has evil thoughts from time to time. That's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about the heart that just dwells on evil and wickedness. Remember Joseph back in the Old Testament? How his brothers, the Bible says, they despised that dude. They hated him. So much so that they conspired and said, let's kill him. Let's kill him. And Reuben said, no, let's not kill him. Let's just sell him away. Not knowing that God was using them to bring about his glory through Joseph. God was using them to save themselves. Amen. But it's that kind of heart that devises wickedness that God considers an abomination. The relationship between Saul and David. Remember Saul loved David at first. But when he saw David's victories, when he saw the people were praising David, remember Saul has killed his thousands but David his 10,000. Saul saw that David was getting more praise from the people. Saul became jealous and hated David. He had nothing but wicked thoughts about David. That's what God finds an abomination. He finds an abomination, feet that are swift in running to mischief. You know, folk that are just eager to do wrong. We call them messy. Some folk just love mess. Out in the world and in the church as well. You ever stand in the line in the grocery line and see those magazines? The National Enquirer, you've seen it too. You see, stories about this family's good relationship, boring. Ain't nobody trying to hear that. <clears throat> stories about, well, he went out on her, now they fighting back and forth. Now that's juicy, now we're talking. I want to hear some more of that. Folk like mess. But God considers that an abomination. And then he says a false witness that speaks lies. No doubt if you were called to testify in court, you'd be asked to raise your hand and swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And if you violated that, it would be called perjury. That's what happened to our Lord Jesus, Matthew chapter 14. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could kill him. But you and I know Jesus was sinless. So they had to fabricate evidence. They had to make up evidence. Verse 56, many testified falsely against him. They committed perjury. God finds that an abomination. And many more stood up and just lied on Jesus. God finds it an abomination because it destroys relationships. It destroys families. It destroys churches. A false witness that speaks lies. It destroys communities. It destroys nations. God finds it an abomination. And then he said, he that sows discord among the brethren. God especially finds that abomination. Remember Jesus when he's about to die. John chapter 17. He takes time to pray. Not so much for himself but for everybody else. For his disciples and for everyone who would believe on him through their message. Jesus said Father I pray for them. I pray for every church. Jesus knew about Metropolitan. 
I pray for Metropolitan, Forest Hill, Southside, Westside, every church. I pray, Father, that they will be one. Yes. That they won't sow discord among one another. Because I know, Father, you find that an abomination. Jesus prayed for unity in the church. And yet, many have surrendered to the instructions of Satan and allowed discord to be sown in the church to the destruction of many of God's churches from the first century all the way up, what century are we in? The 20th century? To this century right here. To <laughs> twenty first. Thank you, brother. I told you I wasn't that smart in school, man. Proverbs chapter 28. Without wood, a fire can't burn. It's going to go out. Without gossip, without sowing discord, a quarrel cannot go on. They were engaged in Satan's work. Those who are sowing discord and those who sow discord who want to gossip. When someone brings mess to you, what they are trying to do is drag you into their quagmire. Quagmire is a messy, nasty pit. And they're just trying to drag you down in it. And when someone comes to you and says, you know what? When they whisper, you know it's going to be messed. You know that, don't you? But, but what do we do when we hear me? <laughs> Romans chapter 16. I'm going to pray for all of us. Romans chapter 16. The Bible says, watch out for folk like that. And mark them and stay away from them. He said their speech is smooth and it's slick and it's deceptive and it will lead naive people astray. But some folks try to dress it up though. They say, well, I don't know if this is true or not. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you because I want you to pray about it. <laughs> That's even more sin sinful than straight out gossip. But church folk can be messy like that. All this are the works of the flesh. Remember Paul talks about the works of the flesh versus the works of the spirit over in Galatians chapter 5? Say nothing but the works of the flesh. And God finds it an abomination. He hates it. God hates your sins. God hates your sins. And God hates my sins. But here's the thing. He loves every one of us. And his desire is that we Surrender to his spirit and say no every time the devil whispers here. This morning, if your walk with God is not as close as it could be, should be, would be, and you need the prayers of the church, we invite you to make a note while we stand.